It's a really sunny morning again. I don't know, we're having a whole string of good luck over here with the British weather and I hope that the sun's shining for you wherever you are. Even if it's raining, that can also be sometimes interpreted as beautiful showers of meta blessings from the devas. <laughs> yeah, so everything has its beauty. So anyway, today is the last day, but not really because it's the first day of your practice life. But um, it's the last day of this little online retreat. And uh, this morning, as usual, we're going to start with some guy. Is it Dhamma talk first? A Dhamma talk from Ajahn. Yeah, yeah Hannah. Okay. Guided meditation after. Yeah. And then, yeah, a little break and then a guided meditation. So enjoy your morning. Okay. Is it ready? Steady? Go. Excellent. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. And I hope so far some of the teachings have been useful for you. I often describe giving a Dharma talk as like a buffet. There's many sort of things on offer there for you. Some you've heard already, some you've never heard, some are easy to understand, some are not so easy to understand. And there also is some parts of the buffet where you have to keep eating a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to get the full message of what it said. I still recall so many times uh, reading through the suttas and the same story, the same simile would come out again and again and again. And at first I thought that was boring, but later on you realize every time you heard what you thought was the same old story, you actually uh, went deeper into it. You understand more of it. It's like the, the mind was drawn deeper into its meaning. And it took a long time, many, many listenings to be able to really get into it and understand its power and the fact that it does liberate you. So I'm just talking today a little bit about liberation, what that actually means. Because sometimes we feel we want to be free, but free from what? And that's why that I often uh, understood it's a very deep meaning, the two types of freedom. One is the freedom of desire in other words that if you ever you want a desire or a fantasy or want to work hard to get something you should be given that freedom to do that and that's the freedom where you can go wherever you want do whatever you want and visit whatever you want say whatever you want but that's one type of freedom which we know in the west there's another type of freedom which is far more deep and that is a freedom from desire. A lot of times we feel that desire is something which will get us what we want. But I think you all know by now, either to a great extent or to a, a mild extent, that when we try and get something, we work hard to attain it. A lot of the time we feel it's unfaithful to us. It promised so much, but it delivers not what we actually expected. And after a while, especially you know, for those people who are either very wealthy, very powerful, very skilled, uh, very smart, if they ever get what they thought they wanted, after a while it, it, it doesn't taste as, as nice as it should be. And that's one of the reasons why that the freedom of desire is no real freedom at all. Unfortunately, the other type of freedom, the freedom from desire. So you can sit in your, your nice little house, wherever it is. It may not be perfect. It may not be as warm or as cold as you want it to be. You may not be as healthy as you want to be. It may not be as quiet as you want it to be. Sometimes that doesn't matter. When you let go of desire, your freedom from desire, you're liberated from being under the power of desire, then you are free. And you feel it's not you can do whatever you want. It means you don't want to do anything. And it's not that you're depressed, but you're bubbling full of energy and just really happy and energized and blissed out simply because there's nothing you want in the whole world. And that sense of that freedom from desire is something which teaches you what real happiness is. And I think when I gave that simile or that guided meditation 
of the Buddha and the Sati, imagining what the Buddha would have felt like. He could have used all his powers to solve all the problems in the world and make everybody always free from hunger or sickness, but that's not the point. There's another type of freedom, another type of wealth, which you tend to get to know in meditation. It's a wonderful freedom from desire. And I hope each one of you sometimes have been getting into a deep enough meditation and then you uh, get up afterwards and think, what do I want? There's nothing I want in the whole world. I'm so content and satisfied. There's nothing I need, nothing I want. You're just happy just to be here. And it's like a liberation from this always having to want something or get something or, or grow something or attain something. It doesn't mean that you are not kind. That kindness is what happens when you're not considering yourself and what you need and all that energy can go out to help others. And it's one of the reasons why you find some of the most kind and compassionate people are some of these people who have been meditating a lot and they become so sensitive to others that they just, they don't need anything for themselves. So they just give. And also a test of that is when people get criticized, oh, well, it's not me who's being criticized. It's just sometimes people see what you're doing and their ideas about you are what get criticized. There's no me in here, no me in here to be criticized. You know, it's like you're an empty target. So something shoots something at you and it just goes right through. There's nothing solid there left to hit. And so because of that, uh, the liberation, which the, I understand the Buddha talked about, was like the liberation, you know, from things like wanting. And when wanting disappears, of course, control disappears. So you're free, you're at ease. Whatever happens, it doesn't really matter to you, even if it's painful. Yes, you go, ow, if it hurts, but it's, you don't, so it doesn't linger for you. You know that sometimes, uh, you know, at my lunch today, which was you know, a few hours ago, you know, some old disciples brought their kids along. And one of the things they were saying, that their little kids, uh, they're great. They sometimes they fight and they cry. And then one minute later, they're in peace and harmony together. They're teaching them what happens when you don't hold on to the past. And you can be free and can love anybody almost. What that means, again, is there's the business you have in life, the stuff which torments your mind, which gives you business, unfinished business to complete. That doesn't exist anymore. You're liberated from unfinished business. And again, I can't go past that little simile of Ajahn Buddha Dasa, who was building his main hall in his monastery. And when it came to the rains retreat, uh, he told all the workers to go home. They hadn't finished the work yet, but there was something more important than doing that work and doing building work. And what he said to his workers was, you know, just come back after three months, after the range retreat is finished. And it never mattered that the building wasn't finished. It never mattered that it was delayed. So, when visitors came, of course, that wonderful little story, a visitor came and said, when is your hall going to be finished? And the beautiful response of Ajahn Buddha Dasa was, the hall is finished. And that was such a weird thing to say. Are you going to leave it like this? Is, a, is this a new architectural expression of finished? No leaving glass out of the windows and no roof on. Is that how it's going to keep it like that forever? And Ajahn Buddha Dasa, of course, said, no. What's done is finished. What's done is finished. And I love that expression. It was so rare that someone can actually do that, leave it unfinished on purpose for three months. Now, he was quite okay. And Sangha and visitors in the monastery were okay. He was saying there's something more important than getting things done. There's something more important than completing everything. Because things never get totally completed anyway. So it's a great idea and understanding of the nature of this world. And if you really want to know what things being finished are, always understand that what's done is finished and take some time off. Now, I'm 
very proud of each one of you, you're taking these three days off. So you're not going to work, you're not doing stuff, and you're giving three days to actually doing absolutely nothing. I hope. Of course, most of you do a bit of things in the background, but it'd be wonderful if you can just be free, liberated from this chore of always having to do something. And worse than that, measuring yourself about what you've actually done. And you see what a person, what have you done in the last year? And if you can say nothing much, sadhu, 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 for a great friend of mine. And when I decide to do nothing much, it's amazing how much stuff gets done. It's kind of weird, but that's the best way of building and doing stuff. Learning how to not worry about it and taking that time off and liberating the mind. So what, what are you doing when you sit down to meditate? What are you doing? And a lot of times we're doing too much. We're trying to make ourselves peaceful. If it's not peaceful, we ask why? And what am I doing wrong? You're doing nothing wrong. And that's why when people say, can you give me some advice on how I can change this, how I can do something different? And the idea, I do give a few words, but they're all rubbish. The best thing to do, leave it alone. And it will actually change by itself. That's one of the beautiful things of what I learned from Ajahn Chah and from every other teacher I've been to. Just sit there and just stop, as I said the other day. But even more than that, to really liberate your mind, you know, Westerners, you know, everyone listening to this talk, and I'm not just people born in the West. Of course, as you all know, I don't live in the West. I'm not a Westerner. I'm a Southerner. Australia is not in the West. It's in the South, the Deep South. <laughs> we don't speak with a, a Southern American accent. Hi, y'all. I'm sorry, that didn't go down very well, but I tried. But it doesn't matter. If you don't succeed, it doesn't really matter. And the important thing is you have fun trying. And that liberates you from some of the terrible uh, demands. You know, sometimes, like many other people, you look at life like you're in a prison cell. And if you're in a prison cell, who's the who's the, the warder, the guard, your prison officer who always gives you a hard time? And I always looked at that prison officer and I gave him the name. Actually, it's almost stealing a name. Uh, from this, uh, I called him Will, Will Sankara, I call the prison guard, We're always making you do things, never letting you sit down still, never letting you become peaceful, you get reasonably peaceful, now what should I do, what should I will, and that makes just the meditation just so much of a mess, you get close to freedom, close to being still and having nothing to do in the whole world. And it's not as if you stop willing, just the will vanishes. And imagine what that's like, just when you're sitting down there and there's nothing you want in the whole world and the will just stops because there's nothing you want. There's no future for that will to land in. There's no past which that will lingers in because you didn't get it right. The whole thing called will just calms down and stops. And I should mention here that, that what that's actually called in Pali is Sabha Sankara Samatha. And you find that instead stated by the Buddha. There's few people in this world will know what Sabha Sankara Samatha really means. What that means is all your will, your choice, your volitions, all stopping, ceasing, calming down. Imagine what that's like. You're just sitting here, you're perfectly aware, perfectly uh, awake. And because nothing is moving, because there's nothing to choose, nothing to press, nothing to do, imagine what that must feel like. You get blissed out. No people think if I don't do something, you'd fall asleep. Okay, you can fall asleep for a little while, but don't worry about falling asleep. I, if you haven't done this already, I think many of you know the Ananda method of enlightenment. Poor old Ananda was trying, this is the Buddha's disciple, trying so hard to get enlightened before the first council. He was going to be meeting with 499 
other arahats. He was the only one who wasn't enlightened, and he was very embarrassed about it. And so he was up all night trying to become enlightened, and then in the end, he wasn't. So he decided just to go to bed, have a nap before the meeting, if they'd allow him in. And just as his head hit the pillow, that's when enlightenment happened. He'd let go. He would stop striving. He was meditating all night. He had all the causes in place. The only thing he needed to do is to stop, to be peaceful. And all his enlightened factors just arose. As of course, you know, he had such good causes in place. They had to. It's automatic. You don't do enlightenment. It just it liberates you liberates from all this striving and controlling and with the striving there comes always disappointments and frustrations and all this uh, wanting to you know if i don't get it this way it must be i'm not wanting in the correct directions you want again you want again you want again and you just get really tired in the end so imagine all that wanting vanishes and all the judgments vanish as well I often look at judgments and what right have we to actually to judge even ourselves? That's actually what we've been taught to do. Other people tell us you're lazy or you're fat or you're stupid. They've got no right because how do they know who you are and what you're doing? And when you get liberated from the comments of other people, wow, you are free. And so that means you can just sit down, meditate, and you can't even uh, judge or measure what type of meditation you are doing. I don't know how many scientists there are uh, on this retreat, but you know the Royal Society of Science in London, you know, two or three hundred years ago, it was founded. And one of the reasons why it was founded, the first president, I think Lord Kelvin, that you know he developed the Kelvin scale of, of temperature. He once noticed that the only way we can control nature and have technology as we know it, the only way we can control nature is learn how to measure nature accurately, which is one of the reasons why the first part of science was learning how to weigh and measure, have standard measurements, standard time, uh, in order to have what we now know as technology, the control of nature, kind of. But nevertheless, when somebody asked me what I thought of that, I always like to turn it around. What happens if you don't measure nature? You put aside all the clocks, all the gauges, all the thermometers, everything, you put it aside, then you can't control nature. Nature is now free. What happens if you stop measuring yourself? You don't measure. How is that meditation? How enlightened are you? How peaceful are you? Imagine not measuring at all, which means that you can't do anything. You're free. Imagine what that feels like. How many like birds weigh their baggage before they take off to migrate to another country? And how many times do you go through customs and have your baggage measured and checked and assessed? And all that measurement, what does that feel like? It does feel just so uh, restrictive, so being judged. And imagine you don't have any of that. You're just free, you just go, you just fly like a bird with only the weight of its wings as its burden. That type of freedom, that's what's expressed in meditation. You sit down there and you know where you are, but you don't measure it at all. Here you are. Are you peaceful? Are you agitated? Stop measuring. And when you don't measure like that, it's incredible just how peaceful you soon become. You can't say good or bad. All these goods and bads in the world, sometimes, you know, what actually are they? I remember just telling people whenever they have any sickness in their body, and sometimes they say to the doctor, I'm sick again, doctor. and and something's wrong with me. And just when they say something like that, wrong? Many times sicknesses which you have are just the way of the body trying to heal itself. It's not wrong. If you have a fever, it's designed to make your body so hot, it can burn off all the bacteria or viruses or whatever. 
It's a way of healing. It's a good thing if you have a fever, as long as it's not too high, because it burns things off and makes you more healthy afterwards. So sometimes the measuring, and since I already measured by saying it's a good thing, but all that measuring and that comparing uh, create the wanting, and the wanting creates the stress. And it's lovely to be able to sit down and close your eyes and just say, I don't want anything in the whole world. I'm just happy just to be here. And sometimes if you say things like that at the beginning of the meditation, you've got nowhere, nothing to do, nowhere to go, which means past and future just disappear. Nothing you want, and that stress in your mind, the gap between where you are and where you want to be, that's called longing, just vanishes, which means you are here. You're in this moment because there's nothing propelling you out of it. And you're content in this moment because there's nothing pushing you away. And because of that, you just go in to this moment. This is not a, a, a thing which doesn't even move. The non-longing, the contentment, being easily satisfied, being at peace in this moment, letting go of, of, of wanting and ill will and trying to get rid of things, it means you don't even move except to go inwards. You can't go forward and you can't go backwards. The only place to go is inwards. And that's what happens in this meditation. The liberation starts to affect that you don't go anywhere, you stay here, but just go deep inside of yourself, inside your body, inside your mind. And as you go deep inside of you, you get access to this thing you call the mind. You know, the mind, you know, which is at the center of you, you might say, is, and you might say, because it's not an eternal being, it's just this little process. But when you go deep inside of it, it's an amazing world. You know, they call it chitta. And in Pali, the word chitta almost always means beautiful as well, delightful. Sometimes they give that as a name to a person who's particularly uh, delightful, delightful looking. I remember there was uh, this prince of the royal family in Thailand many years ago called Prince Chitra. And he became well known because he went to the south and conquered a bit of what's now northern Malaysia. And one of the towns he founded there was called Chitra. After him, he was the founder or the conqueror of that area. And all it means is beautiful. And that's something which, when one gets to understand what this mind is, it is lovely to look at. And when it's lovely to look at, you allow yourself to go inside of it. And you can stay there for such a long time because you're having this meditation is very, very pleasant. The more liberated you are, the more at ease you are, the more freedom you feel. And there's different types of this happiness. You know that sometimes you climb a mountain if you ever walked in the mountains and you think this is the highest mountain and from the top of that mountain you can see other mountains which look so much more beautiful than the one you've just been in. And sometimes that you realize just uh, how the happiness which you first felt, even in just getting peaceful in meditation, you can liberate the mind even further. And the liberation feels just so delightful. One of the similes which, you know, from experience, which I wrote about many times before, was the experience of a just a turned 18 and just having the freedom to go and explore places like the jungles of Central America and go into this uh, part of the jungle in the Yucatan Peninsula. It was in Guatemala, in Guatemala, where there's ancient Mayan ru ruins were, Tikal. And in those days, just as a 1969, you could actually just walk unimpeded through those jungle ruins. I was careful not to damage anything, but still as a young, healthy young man walking up to the top of one of those pyramids and realizing what they were there for. At the top of those pyramids, you were above the tree line and you could see so far, unimpeded, free, 
because you are outside and above the tree line. And remember those jungles that were just so thick with foliage, with so many leaves and bushes and, and vines all over the place. And so the wind could not actually penetrate much of that uh, understory of the jungle. When you were down in the bottom, it was so humid and close and you sweated a lot when you got to the top of those uh, pyramids in the jungle. At last you could feel the wind. It was so refreshing, but even more than that, at the top of those pyramids, you can look in all directions and you can see the jungle laid out before you for miles and miles and miles. There was a kind of a sense of freedom that there was nothing blocking you from seeing from insight to infinity and unbounded, free. And even that felt just, well, not felt, it was a kind of liberating. And sometimes the liberation which you can feel in meditation is even better. You can see so much deeper, so much further, so much more profound. Nothing is blocking you. Old ideas, dogma, and uh, what you're supposed to believe, what you're supposed to see, was all removed from you. You can actually see forever if you wanted to. Or you can just close your eyes and just enjoy the coolness of the breeze flowing past you on the top of those pyramids deep in the jungle of the Yucatan Peninsula. And it was experiences like that which, you know, made you understand just what liberation really is. And so when we talk about you know, the uh, remote Yang Chitang, that's the 12th stage of Anapanasati, liberating the mind. It's not just liberating the mind from senses and the five senses, it's liberating this mind from all types of ideas and views. And you can see it for what it truly is, just a process, nothing much there. Liberating it from fear. I know that many times fear comes up in meditation. If you want to really get into deep meditation and deep insight, you have to be courageous. Put aside your fear. You've got nothing to lose except everything. <laughs> your sense of self, your sense of suffering, your sense of being uh, under very heavy burdens of having to do something, having to protect things. When you see this jitta, you don't own anything at all. You're free, you're unburdened, nothing to pin any blame on, nothing to pin any success on. You're just totally free. And when you can experience that freedom, wow, that's real freedom. The freedom from desire. The idea that desire will never afflict you anymore. There's never any sense of success or failure anymore. There's no one is successful, no one failing. And that's one of the reasons why uh, recently I was uh, talking about, in this was in Thailand when I was giving a retreat over there. You know, what is sort of enlightenment? And I remember sort of telling uh, everybody in this retreat over in Bangkok that uh, the story of Ananda listening to the Buddha, well, two monks came up to the Buddha to express that they were fully enlightened. And how they said that really inspired me. How they expressed their enlightenment to the Buddha in that age, they went up and said that one who is enlightened never thinks they're better than anybody else never thinks they're worse than anybody else, never thinks they're the same as anybody else. A very simple statement. And the Buddha said, yes, correct. And another monk said exactly the same. One who is enlightened, never thinks they're better than anybody else, never thinks they're worse than anybody else, never thinks they're the same as anybody else. Yes. And that's when the Lord Buddha turned around and said, that's how two new arahats expressed to me what they've just seen and what they now are. It's like a disappearing, uh, a freedom from always trying to live up to other people's expectations and views, trying to live up to your own expectations and views of what you should be doing, how you should be acting or reacting, and uh, worrying what other people think of you. And because you're not better than anybody else, you're not worse than anybody else, you're not the same as anybody else. It liberates you 
and one of the biggest burdens which human beings face today, always trying to live up to other people's expectations or meet your own uh, ideas of what you think you should be doing or what you think you shouldn't be doing. All of those things just vanish and don't ever think that that's an excuse for breaking precepts. There's no reason to break any precepts anymore. The idea of, of sense of self and wanting and ill will and harming and hurting is just not there anymore. So you do become a pure hearted being to other people. You know, pure action, pure livelihood, pure speech, because you know, that's just, there's nothing to impress anybody anymore. It's a sense of liberation. And when you start to understand that when you're sitting down cross-legged or on a chair, it also means that you don't force yourself to sit in one particular posture. You can sit in any posture as long as it's comfortable. And sometimes even, I know that sometimes people when they're meditating, they get an inappropriate posture. It's kind of hurts, you get some pain. And people said, should I carry on sitting meditation or should I move? And the answer is that there are some types of pain, discomfort in meditation where you should move. And if you do move, move slowly and mindfully. It takes maybe about a minute to change the posture slightly just so that ache and pain disappears. And you do go backwards in your meditation, kind of, for that uh, next two or three minutes. But you still make up lost ground and you can go much further, much deeper afterwards. It's like basic common sense. And if it really hurts, move slightly. But you shouldn't be able to need to do that more than once or twice during a long sitting. So that means that you still fence this sense of freedom and liberation. It's not like being in an army camp. You know, you're the only person who sees what you're doing and you know what you need to do. Nobody else should ever feel they can judge you for that. Unless they can read their mind and if they can read your mind, they shouldn't be doing that anyway. And please don't worry about anyone who could read minds because most people's minds aren't fit for reading. <laughs> you know, I like, you know, when I was young, I don't read novels these days, I like good books to read. And so much of our minds, like I used to call them pulp fiction. And later on, they made a movie out of that and it became quite a popular movie. I always thought pulp fiction was to turn you off from reading what's the contents of such books. And so the contents of such minds, don't worry about anything at all. Be liberated, feel free. When there's nothing you want in the whole world and there's nothing you need in the whole world and no, there's no measuring left. No sort of good, bad, this was a great meditation, this was a bad meditation, this is what I should be doing but I didn't do it. All of that sort of stuff. Allow that to fade away. You're not the judge. And anyway, part of our rules of discipline for monks, one thing which I really liked when I studied that was that it's always you're trying to be on, on sort of the miscreant's side. Find some reasons, you know, to excuse them. Find the loopholes. You're not supposed to be a, a prosecutor who's always mean and nasty. Always just have be this kind and gentle defense attorney at the end of your meditation retreat you feel just not what you've done wrong but what you've done kind of right if you wish and build yourself up remember the beautiful parts of the meditation and the more you remember the beautiful parts of the meditation the more inspiring it is and the more it liberates you so eventually the idea of liberating leaving the burdens behind and enjoy the freedom which comes when you drop all those burdens. I think yesterday I taught about you know, the shopping bags, which is a similar, which everyone should be able to understand. You know, those heavy bags, if you haven't gone shopping, going through the airport with suitcases. In the old days, especially when they didn't have wheels on those suitcases. In the old days, the simile was far more, uh, far more um, understandable. You're carrying heavy suitcases. And just how burdensome that is and how it tires you and you just put them down just even for a few minutes and when you put them down for a few minutes life feels so much more free and sometimes is a scared a fear of putting down any burden that you know there'll be some 
compensation you have to pay afterwards, that you need some of the things inside those bags. And you're afraid when you start to let go of things like your body and the five senses and your will and parts of your consciousness. You know, oh my goodness, I can't let this go. This is who I am. It's not who you are. And this is where the wisdom, the insights of meditation, of non-self, the Buddha kept on saying, you don't own anything. None of these things is yours. The five components of existence, the five candors, they're not who you are. When you understand that more and more, you can let things go more and more. And you're liberated from these things. You're free from them. You're not having to carry them around wherever you go. And when you understand that, the meditation gets so much more easy, so much more free. You can let go so much more without the, the tears and the grimacing. And the, I don't want to let go. Freedom, liberation, that's what this path is leading to. Liberation and freedom, not just from things like sense spaces, liberation and freedom from suffering. You don't need to feel that terrible pain inside of you. You know, that what, what is life? Why is life? Why is it so painful? Why is it so disappointing? Why is it just that the things which I care for and love, why are they just taken away from me? Why do I see other people suffer? You understand all of that. And the real suffering in life is not physical. It's the emotional suffering. That's by far the worst. The physical suffering is actually just not hard to let go of. It's the emotional suffering that just binds us. And because it binds us, we find it difficult to escape from the, the grief and the fear and the sense of loss and the unfair part of life. And life is never unfair. It's opportunities to learn you're not in control. And no matter how powerful you think you are, you, we all have to escape these disappointments. But when you expect disappointments in life, this part of life, you expect sicknesses and death in life, this part of life, then you're free from them. You feel this great sense of liberation. I don't need to fight and struggle anymore. I can let go. And when you can let go, then you really are liberated. You're liberated not just from the five senses, but liberated from all those ties and attachments which hold you back. Sometimes I visualize the life like uh, the hot air balloon. So you're in a hot air balloon and you throw away a lot of your uh, possessions, you become a nun or become a monk, and you rise so far up into the sky, there's hardly the same sort of weight and burden which other people have. But you only go so far when you let go of material things. But then you look in the basket of the hot air balloon and you find, what else can I throw out? You throw now all of the, all of the ballast, all of the baggage, all the suitcases, your lunch, your spare clothes, everything is out. And so now what can you throw out? And then you get this wonderful idea that untie the basket, let the basket fall off. When you untie the basket and the basket falls off the hot air balloon, then you really go high. And the basket stands for your body. And with all of its... Uh, clothing, it's all its recognizable features, including your brain and all its memories. And when the basket falls off, then it's just you holding onto the balloon. You go so high, but you haven't entered Nibbana yet. So the next thing which you throw, throw off, I think you all know the answer to that question, you throw you off. So your sense of self vanishes. And so there's no weight on the balloon at all. So it just flies off into Nibbana and never comes back. So that's like being liberated. I know that's not the best simile, but I think it's a nice one to finish off this morning's talk with. Let go of the whole caboodle. And I think caboodle, hope you understand, means everything you can possibly see. Let it go. Thank you for listening. And now to continue on that, please go to the toilet and let go. 
Okay. Wow, everyone's frozen. They must have all become enlightened. You okay? There you go, Dodger. I'll speak for everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so time to break. And then we have a guided meditation. Correct? Correct. Correct. So liberate your bodily um, burdens. And then, and then I give a quick guided guidance in the meditation and let you just soar up the pyramids into the free air above the jungle of our world and be able to just experience, being able to see unimpeded forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good, Ajahn. Thank you. <laughs> you can also have a break if you need one. Yeah, a bit of water. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you, you teach something like that and inspires yourself. You know, even though you are thirsty, you just don't feel like anything. If you hadn't have said, have a glass of water, I probably wouldn't have. Your health. We body. Matthias. <laughs> we can't click over the clink over the internet. Ah. Oh, oh, yeah. It's <laughs> nothing in it. It's empty. Bang. It's empty. Empty. Wow, you're more advanced than I am. I've got water <laughs> in this. I think this is empty. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, quite honestly, the one thing about teaching on the internet that I just, and it's a waste of time looking at the screen, you only see a few people there. It would be wonderful if, you know, somehow you could see everybody together. Even I don't know how you can ever do that. Because I, whenever I give a talk, I really try to feel how other everybody else is when they're listening, and that's what happens live. They always look at the audience, and you can connect with them that way. And sometimes you, I'm personally concerned when I'm giving a talk: am I hitting the spot with people? And I usually find that out by looking at people's faces. So hopefully. It was hitting the spot close enough. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, you know Renovel and Pekka were talking yesterday, and from our perspective, this is as good yeah. as a person retreat. She was surprised because uh, I don't think you've done yeah. that online, and she was like, that can't be any good, like just sitting and looking at a screen and seeing these boxes. Yeah. But then she's like, yeah. actually, you can really feel the energy. It's even better than an in-person retreat. Okay. Like more solitude. You know, and more yeah, uh, members, and then it's like the teachings are zooming into our home. So yeah. I personally feel you can connect quite well with people, even on a screen. <laughs> Thank it's you. A weird thing, but I feel that yeah, uh, the kind I of I... like of empathy or whatever it is, uh, yeah, and connect with the energy in the group. That may be the case because I know most of you. Yeah, seen you before. Uh, in so many different places mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like tuning in yeah. with people yeah because honestly i i do not plan these talks as you always know it sometimes surprises me where did that idea or that talk come from right it's almost like to... trusting isn't it that it's yeah indeed 
connecting with something happening in the room. And people do feel, I mean, probably not all the time for everyone, yeah. but I think people often feel that the talks are speaking to them, you know. Yeah. And that's just the Dhamma, isn't it? Isn't that just... Yes, it is. It's also where it comes from. I often just, obviously, concern I don't get into Labha Sakara Saloka. That's the Buddha's way of saying, you know, gains honor and fame, pride. That's always a big danger when you give talks or when you're, you're a leader. But years ago, I saw through that and I realized I, I, I never give a talk. Other things which I say, that is mostly coming from an Ajahn Chah. Or other things which I've heard and understood over so many years, they're coming from the Buddha. I don't want to be proud about that, but just it's not me. And so I don't feel responsible for these talks at all. And often what happens is that I give a talk and this idea comes up and I think, wow, that's really cool. Where did that come from? Yeah, they came from my mouth, but not from just, you know, my will. And that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. It's almost like the more you disappear, the more the Dhamma can come out. Yes. That's what I try and do. Mm. But disappearing is not what you do. It's just what happens when you don't do. Mm. And you feel free yourself. It'd be terrible if I gave a talk on liberation and I'm feeling just more bound up in things. Anyway, are people back now, Matthias? <laughs> Matthias? Or are they still in the loo? They're back? back? Okay. Okay, so I can do a guided meditation for 40 minutes, is that? Is that okay? That's Excellent. Awesome. So I can kind of shut up in the last part of the meditation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, get yourself really comfortable. Spend time fidgeting at the beginning. I did a nice yawn. That's what my body wanted to do. I trust my body when I start meditating. I listen to it. I don't expect things from it. My main job is to find the most comfortable abiding, otherwise known as relax to the max. And I'm sitting on an office chair, because that makes me visible <laughs> to the computer screen. I hardly ever sit like this, except doing a guided meditation online. But I don't mind, it's kind of interesting. And I feel my body. I let it be. I'm not trying to force it into something. Never trying to hold it back. But to see how it feels. I'm inquiring, body, how are you? What do you need? How do you feel? I know I, this is the usual guided meditation, but I find it by far the most useful. Just a body scan. Feel Feet. How do you feel now? And I, I do this because as soon as I become aware of my feet, I nearly always need to move them to get them more comfortable. And 
it's quite obvious. So how do I know if my feet are comfortable when I don't look at them and don't be aware of them? So I'm aware of my feet. And they tell me straight away that they needed to be moved. Just adjusted, not greatly. Now I've moved them, they really feel at ease now. They are comfortable now. And because they're comfortable, I, I go deeper. I just stay with my feet and they surprise me. They get really comfortable, like super comfortable. And it's a kind of pleasure in my feet. This is not some kind of weird fetish. This is a pleasure which is relaxing and peaceful, not exciting. It makes my feet feel they can lose more tension in them. So every muscle is like loose. Every tendon is not stretched. And the blood vessels are so free and unrestricted. The blood flows so freely throughout those vessels. My whole feet, the nearest I can say is I've been soaking in a hot bath of water for a long time. And they feel just so relaxed. I just do this sitting on a chair with my eyes closed. I'd just like to stay here longer. That's what happens when you get the delights in this meditation. It just gives rise to stillness. Mindfulness does not want to move anywhere. I just started off with heat. I haven't got any further yet. If that's you, then just stay with me on the feet. Otherwise, just move up your body. But I'm gonna stay with my feet this time, just explore what, how, mindfulness, how mindful and kind I can be to my own feet. I feel them become so loose. There was some tightness I never noticed before. And the mind will go to those places by itself. I don't tell it what to do or send it anywhere. I'm just aware of these feelings in my feet. And the feel in the left, I don't know what you even call it, it's the left foot to the left of the, the main ball of the feet. I can feel that kind of tingling. It feels good. There was a tight spot in there a moment ago. But now just being aware of that area. It's all got really loose and free. It has a certain feeling to it. Of nothing being held tight. Everything at ease and loose. And so when that happens, all the blood and the lymph or whatever else flows through those feet flows through unimpeded. It goes easily through. And this, as it goes through my feet, the blood going through those vessels is again nourishing. It doesn't just bring oxygen, I'm sure it brings so many other things to make the muscles, the tendons, even the bones in my feet healthy. If there's any bruise, that bruise gets quickly healed. If there's any tightness or cuts, everything just recovers so quickly when my feet are totally relaxed. I can even feel some parts of my instep which were tight a moment ago. 
Now I'm aware of them. They very quickly just relax. It's almost as if all they ever wanted was me to notice them. They feel they're protected and cared for. And me, I mean my my attention to notice them. So many parts of my body get ignored. And because I'm not aware of them, sometimes they can get sore or sick or tight and tense and bruised. Now I can almost be totally aware of every part of my foot, my feet. I feel just, again, some of the parts of the feet, I don't know what to call them. This is on the, the edge of my feet, in the middle, on the left foot. You can feel, uh, and it was when I started talking, a tightness there. Now that tightness has been released. So my whole feet, the left and right, just becoming so at ease. They've probably never been as relaxed as this before for a long time. And I'm going to just, to, okay, I'm going to try this, to jump. So I just relax just one little part of my body, my feet. But that gives me enough focus because it's very pleasant down there. So I stay with that area. As if my feet are the center of my attention. My awareness is right on them. And it's pleasant enough, it does not want to move. I don't try to maintain my awareness on my feet. My feet has grabbed that awareness. And the awareness is happy down there. So I'm aware of just feet. And already it's kind of transforming. It's like the breath meditation. I'm not aware of the breath, just aware of feet. Feet feeling. That awareness is almost continuous. It's just like the third stage of breath meditation, full awareness of the breath. And this is full awareness of the feet. And it's so pleasant down there that all other parts of my body, other than the speech, are beginning to fall away. You're focusing on just one part. Zooming in. So anything on the edge just disappears. Also the feeling of the feet change. They change from the physical feeling of the feet to the emotional feeling of the feet and meaningless. It's how the mind experiences this sensation. One thing which I train myself to notice is how peaceful that sensation is. Peace is in the mind, not in the feet. But nevertheless, the feeling in the feet have generated this clearly, clearly seen peace. It's like I don't have to do anything to my feet. All the jobs are done. It's peaceful, inviting me to rest, just to stay here and not go anywhere. And always take that feeling of peace as my first introduction to the mind. Peace is a quality of the mind, like a tree is a quality which exists only in a garden. And kind of defines the garden. Right, peace defines a mind. And now I must admit I'm becoming more aware of the peace than of a feet, a foot. 
you start somewhere and the most interesting, delightful, beautiful qualities start to dominate. I'm not feeling toes or uppers anymore. I'm feeling the peace that is generated. Please excuse me. Uh, my mind is telling me to be quiet. But I feel I should say a few more words. I don't do meditation. Experiences, sensations, feelings. Suddenly become so gorgeous. They pull you in. I know they're safe. Been there before. So I have trust. That as I become quiet. These feelings just get deeper. And sometimes it's like what I'm experiencing. The words can't reach that feeling. They can't describe. So they're untrue. They want to explain how you feel for others. But they're only tell such a fraction this almost like deceiving please feel so much be more beautiful than these words please excuse me i have to be quiet
Thank you, Theo. How peaceful and delightful can that be peace become? How liberated, feel free. What does freedom feel like? Free of desire. Free from wanting. How does your body feel? When you're ready, if you can, open the eyes to exit the meditation. Thank you for participating. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that's the ghost behind the machine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can enjoy some walking meditation now if you like, or um, see if you can make some nourishing food for yourself. Don't skimp on the food. It's an act of kindness to eat well, even on retreat. So, and we'll see Ajahn again soon. <laughs> <laughs> see you.